Welcome back once again. 50 years of Spartans and beyond as we continue to take a look at some of the great athletes and games in the history of Case Western Reserve University Athletics. Today we're going to take a look at the first round of the 2007 NCAA Division III football playoffs where Case Western Reserve topped Widener College 21-20 to at the Santo Field. The date was November 17, 2007, and the Spartans were set to play in the first ever NCAA postseason game after completing a 10-0 regular season just the second undefeated regular season in the program history. What followed was an instant classic as the Spartans rallied back from an 11 point deficit in the fourth quarter, topping Widener 21 to 20 on a last second touchdown pass from quarterback Dan Whalen to wide receiver Jeff Mayer. Today we're joined by both Whalen and Mayer along with former defensive back and kick returner Bobby Bott and head coach Greg Devilak. Thank you all for joining us today. So, um, Greg, let's start with you real quick. And if you could tell us, um, the 2007 season was your fourth as the Spartans head coach. And the team, you know, certainly had made a little bit of progress, but was, I think, five and five your first year, three and seven your second, and then five and five again your third. Heading into that 2007 season, did you feel the team was ready to make that jump to a playoff level team? Uh, I'm not sure about the jump all the way to a playoff team. We knew we were going to be good because we had an outstanding, at that time it was a sophomore class, with Dan and, and Bobby when they came in that that recruiting class was was our best and probably still was our best ever and was followed up by a very good freshman class the following year um, so we knew we were we were getting there we were on the right track um, the last game of the 2006 season uh, we had defeated a playoff team Washington and Lee had already um, you know uh, clinched a playoff spot by winning their league um, they played us game 10 and, and we beat the heck out of them. Uh, I mean, we just beat them up. So we knew we had the potential, but uh, I thought we were going to be pretty good in, in 2005 and we had some injuries and went three and seven. So you never really knew, but we knew we, we were starting to accumulate enough talent that we were going to be better, no doubt. It, and we thought we could be very good. Well, you talk about the talent. We have, you know, certainly three of those talented players here. Dan, I'm going to start with you. What brought you to Case Western Reserve as a really good high school quarterback coming to a program that maybe didn't have the storied history of a couple of the other programs in the area? I think that's actually part of, part of what brought me there uh, to begin with. Um, you know, I was getting recruited by the Mount Union, John Carroll, Baldwin Wallace guys as well. But the, the opportunity to come in and compete for the job right away was certainly, you know, a deciding factor as was – just the level of academics and the fact that none of those schools are, are really on, on the same uh, in the same stratosphere's case. So put those things together. Um, the fact that you know the stadium that's in the background behind you, uh, along with the coaching staff and, and the message that they were delivering, it was just uh, it ended up being the right place, right time for me, and uh, you know the rest is history. So great decision. Bobby, I'll ask you the same question. What brought you to Case Western Reserve as a recruit? Well, when I heard Dan Whalen was going, I thought I had to be there. <laughs> uh, Dan and I were also roommates for the majority of the time, so we'll have some banter here today. But uh, I just wanted to keep playing, um, to be honest. <clears throat> you know, I played a lot of different sports like most people in, in high school, and I was thinking I was going to play baseball, but uh, kind of fell back in love with football again my senior year in high school. And uh, like Dan, just married the academic future versus, you know, playing a sport that I love too. So it was actually like the perfect, the perfect storm uh, to make that happen. Um, Jeff, your story is a little bit different than these two. You're a little <laughs> bit more of a circuitous route to get to Case Western Reserve. Um, tell us a little bit about how you found your way to the school. Yeah, I'll try to keep this as brief as I can and uh, <laughs> still kind of explain the uh, routes. But uh, yeah, so uh, I started off at Purdue University uh, and uh, not to play football, just went there for engineering uh, and really found that uh, a big part of who I was was playing football and I missed it so much that uh, decided I wanted to get back into it. So I left uh, Purdue and uh, looked at a couple of uh, OAC schools uh, and schools in Cleveland. Uh, ended up going with uh, Baldwin Wallace College, now university. Uh, and I entered into a program where you actually go to Baldwin Wallace for three years and then you go to Case for two years. It's called a binary engineering program. So uh, between that, um, I did my three years at Baldwin Wallace, uh, unfortunately suffered a couple of, uh, pretty severe, uh, injuries while I was there. 
uh, and uh, it took quite a while to uh, do some rehab and uh, get back to playing shape. Uh, and by that time, I'd really only played about one year Baldwin Wallace and still had a lot uh, left I wanted to uh, leave out on the field. Uh, and that uh, came to my transition to uh, Case Western Reserve at that point, uh, where I basically reached out to Coach Devilak and said, hey, I, I still really want to play. I think I have some eligibility here. I have to come to your school for academics. Uh, and uh, he really opened up his arms uh, and gave me really, I'd say, the opportunity of a lifetime to join a, a fantastic team at a uh, opportune time. So uh, very thankful for that, uh, just given that opportunity. So that's kind of how I ended up uh, at Case to, to begin with. Um, I'll throw this out to the group, and, and you can all feel free to answer it. The regular season, you go 10-0, and, and and obviously – um, an incredible regular season. Were there any moments during that regular season that, that particularly stick out in any of your minds is, okay, this is the moment where we know that we are a team that can contend like now, you know, where maybe, you know, that was a turning point or anything like that. Well, well, but Devs, go ahead. Yeah. So our schedule was very unique that year because the following year we were joining uh, the UAA and the NCAC were starting um, a scheduling agreement where we were going to play all of our independent games against the NCAC, but we were one year away from that. So we had to sign a number of one year contracts and just get whoever we could. Two of those teams were startup programs. So the schedule was not exactly challenging until about midway through in the end. Um, the two games that stuck out for me were Carnegie Mellon because they were coming off a, an 11 and one year where they made it the second round of the playoffs and had a lot of kids back, um, but were struggling a little bit uh, when they played us and, and we beat them in, um, on, a, on a field goal. Um, that was the last play of the game. Uh, and then the big game was Wash U. Wash U had a, had a very strong team um, and had played a very good schedule. Um, and that was the game we hadn't beaten Wash U in the history of UAA football, uh, going back uh, 15, 16 years, had never beaten them. So that is, I when we beat them, I, I think that kind of confirmed that that we had we had a, a a very good team that was worthy of being in the playoffs. Um. And let's go to that Wash U game for a second. Dan, you know, I went back and I listened to the broadcast of the NCAA playoff game. And one of the things they really harped on in the beginning was that you got hurt in that Wash U game. Um, how much of a factor coming into the playoff game was that injury? Um, big factor in terms of mobility and in terms of preparation. I, uh, that was probably like the two worst weeks of my entire athletic career, just getting ready for that. And missing the week 10 game, which – we were in a conference that was large enough to get an automatic bid, so we had to win. Um, so that was that was really uh, just disheartening for me, missing week 10 and kind of watching from the sidelines as our playoff destiny was kind of up in the, air, uh, up in the air. Uh, but just the, the rehab uh, and the, the two weeks were brutal. I mean, Bob was my roommate at the time. I think I was using every device known to man to, uh, to get the knee ready. I was in the pool three, days a, or three times a day. Um, I had to sleep with this giant device that bent my knee back and forth all night long, every night. So imagine trying to sleep uh, when, when that's happening. But, you know, it was all to get ready because I wasn't going to miss the game. I just wasn't going to miss the playoff game. And, um, it was important to me. It was an important team and the first one ever for, for the school. So uh, it was pretty, pretty crazy. But by the time uh, you know, the game came around, uh, the adrenaline took away some of that, that pain and we went, went out and did our job. You know, you mentioned the, the fact that you were in a conference that didn't have an automatic bid. Was there any doubt at that point that you were getting in, having, you know, again, I was not there at that moment. Did you guys pretty much know we go 10-0, and 0, we're in, or was it still up in the air at all? I didn't, I didn't think it was up in the air. It was, I don't know if we expected uh, to be a two-seed and host a game. Um, I, th I think that was maybe a little shocking, but I don't know about the rest of the guys. But I think 10-0, we, we knew we were getting in. I just it was a matter of where and – and then where we were going to go. Yeah, we were also we were ranked through the whole back half of that season too. So I think we were pretty confident if we controlled our own destiny, we would we would get in. Like Danny, I didn't think we would get a two seed, and really we got like a one seed because Widener was 
the travel plan, like the 500 mile rule or something like allowed us to have a, an eight seed. So um, it was pretty, we knew we, we knew what we needed to do in the back half of the stretch, but uh, it was pretty fun beating all the UAA teams. Um, never again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, John, I, I think back then they definitely put more emphasis on record than strength of schedule. So that's where I think the two seed came from. I think um, Mount Union and us were the only teams that were undefeated in the North region that year. Um, nowadays, I, we would have been on the road, no doubt, because they put much more emphasis on strength of schedule than they do record. Um, and if we would have gone 9-1, we had no shot. I think we had no shot from, you know, not having playoff experience, poor strength of schedule, um, just just wouldn't have happened. So, yeah, it was – it was like feast or famine. You know, we lose, we're out. We win, we're the two seed. And that, that, that's pretty incredible. Well, let's get into the actual game itself. And, and Greg, I'll, talk, I'll ask you this question. Do you remember what kind of the scout was on Widener? Where, do you remember what you were talking about before the team? Do you remember watching any film? If you were able to get a film of that. Yeah, we had film um, and, and knew a little bit about them. They had, they had won a couple of national championships in the 80s. You know, but it was... 25 years later, um, but they still had that tradition. They played in a strong conference. Uh, their record wasn't good. I think they were eight and two or maybe even seven and three. I, I forget, but they had a couple losses, but again, really good schedule um, and, and just sort of had kind of a pedigree that you had to respect. Uh, the film, they were definitely a strong defensive team. Um, that's what I remember standing out and offensively they were, they were pretty basic. Um, but solid, but they, they definitely had some guys on defense that we were concerned about. Um, and Dan's injury definitely played a, a big role in our, our plan of attack because he, he was not mobile. Um, he definitely could not have played our 10th game, 0% chance, and he was not 100% for the playoff game. So our, our game plan was to try and do a lot of quick passing get the ball out of his hands because by nature he's going to scramble and we didn't want him running around. Um, but <laughs> their defensive plan ended up, yeah, it turned our offensive plan into like the worst plan in the world because they, they took away the quick game stuff. Dan had nowhere to go with the ball a lot of times. Um, so yeah, I, I, I remember, I remember the, the film. I remember the plan. I remember the plan not working well at the beginning at all. Yeah. Um, Bobby, from a defensive perspective, and I was watching that game again, and um, some of those receivers were really, really talented. The one guy that stuck out was Mike Falkenstein, who caught the touchdown early in the game. Um, strategy going in from your perspective defensively, especially against some of those receivers. Oh, man, that's a long time ago, John. <laughs> uh, get into individual game plans. Um, you know, I think just in, as a whole, our, our defense was pretty stout that year of, of my four years you know, at Case, you know, with the collection of the of a upperclassmen with Brew and T. Meyer, that was probably our best bunch, um, you know, and so we were pretty, pretty solid at all levels. Um, so, I mean, we didn't, like, isolate that, that one individual receiver. Uh, we didn't do much different than our base plan. Um, we just wanted to go do our thing. Um. You know, Bobby, I'll stay with you here because you had a couple of really nice returns, especially early in the game. So, um, you know, was, I think your opening kickoff, you brought it right about up to midfield. Um, kind of having that ability to to do that or to start the game off on that. Do you remember that feeling at all when you – I do. And I watched the game, and I was be honest, I was mad because I was like, man, I'm slow. <laughs> because I should, I should have took it. You know, I was thinking, did I get tackled by the kicker? That was my first thing. I had to rewatch it twice, and I didn't, but it was close. Um, I do remember, I mean, the, the energy was really high, you know, going into the playoff game at home. You know, you get the opening kickoff. Dan always wants the ball first. Um, it's just his, you know, tails never fails. I want the ball. Here we go. You know, so we always – we got to – and I'm a defensive player, so every time I get a chance to touch the ball, like, I want to score, um, and I won't, like, go easily out of bounds. Um, so that, that was fun. Um, the, at the end of the game, I remember at the, after they scored their go-ahead, they, they, uh, they started kicking away from me. Um, 
which was disappointing. I would love to have been able to touch the ball at the end there too. But yeah, I do remember the energy. It was really fun. It was pretty exciting. Yeah. And Jeff, I promise we'll get you here eventually. Your heroics kind of <laughs> came at the end of the game. So we'll, we'll get you back in the mix here in just a minute. But no worries. Um, Dan, I, I want to ask you this question because the team did get off to a slow start offensively. You were three and out in your first three drives. And again, we'll talk about the good stuff here eventually. Don't worry. But um, what was going wrong at that point? I know Coach Devilag alluded to kind of taking away the short stuff. Was that the majority of the issues at that point? Well, like Bob, I went back and watched. Uh, it was probably one of my worst halves of football in, in you know, all four of my years there. I, I was airmailing passes. I was not accurate. Maybe some of it was, was having to do with the knee, but I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was. You know, it's funny in the broadcast, they're like, oh, weather's not a factor today. And, and meanwhile, it's like, 20 mile an hour winds and it's it's raining and it was not not a nice day um but i think you know one of the things that we found and it was true in all three years of going to the playoffs was you know our schedule during the year you know was was one thing and then you step into the the round of 32 and uh everybody's good and and everybody's big and everybody's fast and um i think we we found that our game plans had to be adjusted just across the board because you know, we matched up differently in the playoffs than we did for the bulk of the regular season games. So I think it was just, you know, part of it could have been our first time being there as a group. I mean, everybody. Um, and the fact that it was a big moment and just they were ready to play. And, you know, we, uh, we just couldn't get the ball. But we couldn't get anything going in the first half. Um, you know, Bob had a couple of nice kick returns, punt returns that got us up or past midfield. And we would do nothing for it. And then uh, I seemed to have some butterfingers that day. I had a couple of fumbles. Um, I threw a, threw a pick six coming out of our own end zone. So uh, I think actually that season I threw four or five interceptions the whole year and they were all returned for touchdowns. So um, that's, that's one of my, my lasting memories from that year. But um, I don't know. It was just, it was just tough, uh, tough first 30 minutes of football. And, and you go into, the, you know, into halftime and the team is down seven to three. So it's certainly, you know, both teams had their struggles offensively. Um, and it was still certainly a game that was, was anyone's game at that point. Um, Greg, do you remember your message to the team at halftime of that game, what, what you said to them or the general gist of what you said to them? Nope, not at all. I didn't say much. <laughs> ever. Um, I, I thought that, that kind of stuff's kind of overrated. I, I do know that we needed we, – we were playing very well on defense, um, and we – found a way to move the ball uh, we had two really nice drives we only came away with three points um so we had a good mix of running the ball um you know i didn't remember specifics until i rewatched the game billy deitman had a couple of really nice runs um they were mostly an outside zone and then we didn't want to have any quarterback read stuff um, because dan was still hurting but we decided to go to that because uh, Widener didn't know Dan was hurting and they had to defend him as a potential ball carrier and that opened up some of our inside stuff after we went to that so um, we did adjust the, the turnovers did hurt us we had three turnovers that day um, and that always kills you but um, no I, I don't think there was I don't remember certainly don't remember any panic anybody being frustrated um, it was as Dan alluded to a, a really tough day to throw the football um, but I also thought that, you know, you, you don't know anything about these teams that you don't play and, you know, you see them on film, you don't know who they're playing. So, you know, are they better than us? By halftime, I didn't think they were better than us. Uh, that was one thing. If, if we would have lost that game, I would have been really upset because I thought we were the better team and we just weren't playing very well. Offensively, defensively, we were playing well. And you, you mentioned that third quarter interception that was returned for the touchdown. It makes it a 14 to three game, which is actually your largest deficit of the year to that point. Um, you're headed back to the sideline. Do you have that feeling in your head that, Hey, you know, maybe, you know, we're a great team, but maybe just today isn't our day or is it just rally for the next drive immediately? Uh, I'd be lying if I thought we, we weren't putting ourselves in a pickle uh, or I was putting us in a pickle specifically with that, that play. But you know, there were things that were working. So, you know, we, we did hit a lot of those jailbreak screens. We were running that play almost once every series, right? So, and we were hitting Jeff for it a lot. I think Jeff he probably had seven or eight catches that game. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that play was clipping at five, six, ten yards a pop. So, 
that opened some things up for us. Um, and so it was kind of just going back to the sidelines. You know, I had uh, Coach DiCarlo, my quarterback coach, was a very calming force on the sidelines for me. So uh, he was always good at recentering me when I was, was not uh, playing my best. And so I think um, just taking time to look at the scoreboard and say, hey, look, there's 15, 20 minutes left in this game and, and we have opportunities. Uh, defense was certainly keeping us in it as they did pretty much in any game we ever played in. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, we still had a chance, but there was certainly in my mind, like, all right, we got we to flip the switch and we got to start playing a little better um, if we're going to put up, you know, multiple scores. Um, and, you know, you mentioned those, you, you mentioned those screens to, uh, to Jeff. And if you look at that next drive, that's when the game started to change a little bit and move a bit more in your guys' favor. And part of that was, was three screen plays. I think all, it was three and four or five straight plays where you threw screens to Jeff. Jeff, do you remember that? And do you remember getting more involved really starting with that drive? I do. I remember, uh, you know, just like uh, Coach Debs and uh, Dan alluded, the first half, I think we were trying to figure this team out. They were big, physical, confident. They had the experience. Uh, and, you know, we, we hadn't. And uh, we kind of had to adjust our game plan. I think when we started to figure out some things that were working, especially the, the running game, really started to open up uh, some of those screens as well and uh, kind of got the ball moving. Uh, and really, I just remember, you know, being uh, right place, right time for uh, those play calls. Really, it was a scheme more than any one player. I think uh, Ryan Colzar as well got involved in a lot of those screen passes as well. And uh, it was really a great play for us to, to kind of open up other things. So uh, I think that's when we kind of felt the momentum shifting. Well, and, th and that drive ends with six straight runs, including a two-yard touchdown by Corey Checkin. Um, that was at the beginning of the fourth quarter. It makes it 14-9 to nine with about 11 minutes left in the game. Greg, do you remember what you saw on the defense there that you said, hey, we're going to run it four or six straight times here? Was it a change? Were they playing back? Um, what did you see in that situation that that was the move to make? No, we were just struggling um, with the shorter throws. Um, there was just no way, you know, I, it's not like Dan, like, had a bad day passing the ball, like, inaccurate. I, I didn't remember that. I just remember there was no place for him to go because of the scheme they were doing. Um, so I, I wanted to keep the ball on the ground and see if we'd get some success to then open up the pass. And it, it just kept working. So that's one thing. I don't believe in going away from something to do something else if it's working. So until they stop it, just keep doing it. And Corey Check and is pretty much the most unstoppable short yardage guy that we've ever had here. He, he, it was unbelievable. Um, unbelievable. He was his own blocker. Um, so yeah, they, it was working. So we stuck with it and, and got it in. And I think, again, the threat of Dan as a runner also helped. I do remember the inside zones that we ran uh, later were, were much more effective than some of the dives we were doing because the dives weren't quarterback read kind of plays. And uh, when they had to defend Dan as a runner, it opened up some of the things we were doing as um, to giving the ball to the running back. And the screens were helping our outside zone play. That's, that was the complimentary play. So, yeah, it just everything just sort of like kind of clicked together. We weren't hitting big plays yet, but we were getting small chunks and we put together a nice drive and, and, and got some points on the board. Well. It didn't take long for the big play to come. Uh, next drive, you guys stop Widener on third and three um, at your own 44. 7.36 left in the game. Widener punts, pins you back on your own three-yard line. For the next play, Dan, you were able to find Sean nicely with a pass over the middle. He takes it 97 yards for a touchdown, the longest play from scrimmage in the program's history, and it gives you guys your first lead of the game. Dan, I'll come to you in a second here, but Greg, do you remember that play call there, and do you remember – the decision to not run it there with your back up against the end zone. Yeah, I do. And it's sort of a philosophy thing that if I have confidence in our guys, I like throwing in that situation um, because the defense is not going to be set up to stop a short throw. Um, the, the one thing that was a little different, we put a tight end in the game to give Dan more protection because I obviously we didn't want to get him sacked and have a safety and give up two more points. Um, and that safety changed their defense. It brought their free safety up for some reason, and they didn't defend the middle of the field. Um, and watching that, uh, again, 
Dan looked left. They had the quick game covered and looked right, and there was absolutely no one in the middle of the field. And he just threw it to, uh, to Sean nicely. And I, I think I speak for everybody that the entire sideline was just waiting for him to get caught. <laughs> Sean is not our fleetest of foot guy. He's a great receiver, real good quickness, but not top 10 speed. And even, even I think Sean was pretty surprised that he went 95 yards for a touchdown. Glad that was unbelievable. I'm glad you said it, not us. <laughs> you know, Dan, I'll ask you the same thing, and, and I think Greg summarized it pretty well, but what did you see on that play as the quarterback? Um, when, and did you know when you let it go? I'm, I'm taking based on what Greg said. You probably didn't know that it was going to go 97 yards. But um, did, did you have a feeling that, okay, this could be a big play here? <laughs> Well, there's a couple things going on. Like, even though we had just come off a scoring drive, I, I couldn't believe Widener punted the football from where they were. I, I thought, you know, based on the physicality of the game, the low-scoring nature, that they would have, um, you know, tried to get that first down and, and then given us 60, 70 yards to go if they, if they failed. But they punted, uh, pinned us deep. And, you know, I, I remember the play – obviously very well it's, it's a lot I think it's still the longest play in school history if it hasn't been suppressed but I looked left I think we had a, we had a lot of plays where we peaked backside on the first read you know depending on what the defense was doing and uh the safety who was drawn up also happened to start you know heading to that hash mark when when I uh, when I kind of pulled my shoulder back but um started to, to move the pocket to the right after that and I had never seen anybody as wide open as Sean was so um, kind of at that point, you're thinking just, just throw something that he's not, you know, he's not going to outrun or that he's not going to uh, you know, have to have to chase down and just drop it in the basket. So, um, and then at that point, it was off to the races. But I remember feeling like, holy crap! Um, and then as he's running, I'm chasing him. I mean, you kind of can see the back angle when he did the the TV broadcast of I'm sitting there running down the field like with my arms in the air. And um, I think it was at that point I said, all right, well. Now, now we're in the driver's seat for the rest of this game, and there was still some work to do, but uh, it, was, it was a pretty amazing feeling. So after that, again, 15-14, Case Western Reserve takes the lead. Two-point conversion fails, so the teams will exchange, uh, exchange possession a couple times after that, and that sets up a Widener drive, their final drive of the game. Uh, they start at midfield, uh, convert a key third down play. That puts them at the one-yard line, and after a timeout, Ian Decker takes the ball in. And Widener regains the lead 20 to 15 with a minute 27 left. Greg, I'll ask you a strategy question here again. On that one yard run after the timeout, is there talk about, hey, let's just let him score and give Dan the ball back and the offense the ball back with as much time left? Or is that one where you're trying to stop him uh, at any chance you can? No, we were, we were trying to stop him. Um, maybe that wasn't the correct thing to do, but at the time, you know, the strength was our defense, um, and we were going to try and stop him. Um, and it wasn't great weather, you know, extra points were not a gimme. Um, so, no, we were, we were definitely trying to stop them. Um, so, after the kickoff, Case Western Reserve gets the ball back, your own 27-yard line, a minute 21 on the clock. Um, Jeff, I'll ask you this. You head back out on the field there. What's going through your mind at that point? Well, I remember uh, after they scored that touchdown, we had a little powwow with Dan, uh, the and uh, I think we all just knew – that we had the ability, the scheme to to drive down the field and score. Uh, and really, I know personally, I knew if we had Dan, we had a shot. And uh, we were just kind of trusting in the game plan. Uh, I think the two-minute offense was definitely a strength of our team that year uh, with Dan at the helm. So uh, we're really just trusting in, uh, trusting in all the practice and time we put in and that. And, uh, and it definitely paid off. So just under 90 seconds left in the game, Dan, you drop back to pass on all 14 plays on that drive, which you know, the fact you get 14 plays off in a minute, 27 seconds is pretty impressive on its own right. But um, you convert a fourth down, fourth and 10 pass to nicely. That sets you up right about midfield. Another fourth down with 27 seconds left on a 28-yard uh, pass to Jeff. That puts you on the 13. I'm going to go back to one play here in particular. So second and 10, Dan, and you find uh, Brian Webster for six yards. It puts you at the seven-yard line, and it forces the team to take its second time out. And, you know, again, you go back and you watch the video, and there are certain things you notice. And one of the things I noticed was, Dan, you're coming to the sideline. And, Greg, you were not happy at that point. Um, Dan or Greg, do you remember what, what 
you know, what you said at that point, what's going through your mind to that point when it's, it's, you know, hopefully somewhat G rated when we, and when you discuss it here. I, I don't recall specifically. I know Debs and I, we had a lot of vivid exchanges over the years, but <laughs> um, it was all because we wanted to win, right? We wanted to, wanted to do the best thing. We wanted to execute. Um, if I had to guess, it's probably, well, we have now 10 seconds or 12 seconds left in the game. Uh, we couldn't get out of bounds. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what, you know, what the exchange was at that, at that point in time. I just remember that entire drive, the reason we got so many plays off is because we had a lot of incomplete passes and we were stopping the clock and we made it kind of as hard on ourselves as possible. Uh, but if you go back and look, there's probably some plays that had we caught the ball, you know, we, the clock would have kept going. We would have been in trouble. So funny the way things work out. Hindsight's always, you know, 2020, but, um, those those four down plays, you know, the one, the first one to Sean, I remember dropping back and, you know, there's a guy in my face I couldn't see, so I kind of blindly let it rip. And he happened to be there. Um, the one with Jeff, the 28-yard, it was a smash route. And, uh, you know, as he ran the corner, it was, it was nobody on him. I think they botched that coverage. Either that or the corner just played really aggressively on, on the, the hitch. Um, you know, those set us up. But coming to the sideline, it was probably probably more like, you know, Debs and I, like, what do we do now, right? What is our next play call? How do we, how do we make sure we get from the seven-yard line into the end zone without a timeout, um, knowing that we have really two plays to do it? Well, it's, you know, it does set you up a third and four. Uh, first play of the third and four plays, an incomplete pass to Jeff, and that sets up the fourth down play. And I'd like to break that down a little bit piece by piece here. So, um, Greg, I'm going to start with you. Do you remember what play you called in that situation? Oh, yeah. It was a fade stop. Um, yep. There was no hesitation at all. I think Dan wanted it also. Um, and, yeah, that was what we were going to do. And, yeah, it, it was incredible that we converted three fourth down plays. D Dan hit the nail on the head. It, was, it couldn't have worked out any better because it was either incomplete pass or a first down for most of that drive that conserved the time. And just, and just going back, um, the fourth down play that uh, Jeff caught the corner route on, um, we had called the timeout, got out of the field, and Jeff was the outside receiver originally. Um, mm -hmm. Widener called the timeout. We came back in, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have Jeff do this because he, he was the guy that was hot. I think he ended up with 10 or 11 catches that game. So we moved Brian Webster outside. I don't know if Jeff had ever run that route. I'm thinking no. – <laughs> yeah, not – yeah, he had never, but he was the guy, and, and Dan just hit him perfectly between the corner and the safety. Um, but, yeah, the, the play before, we ran a slant, um, and as, as they were all game, they were taking away the quick game, um, and just they were playing man coverage, and it just, it just made a lot of sense to, to run that fade stop. We had a lot of confidence in Dan throws it really well, and he threw it perfectly, and Jeff caught it right on the goal line, and thank goodness had the, you know, the, the smarts to stick the ball out because that, that, I don't know if he would have called it a touchdown unless Jeff would have stuck the ball over the goal line. Well, Dan, I'll ask you from the quarterback's perspective, take us through that play from the time, you know, you basically, you know, step up to the line to the time you let the ball go. Yeah, I, I definitely think I requested that throw. Um, I, even still, when I watch games, whether they're NFL, college, high school, and teams throw like straight fades on the goal line, it, it bothers me. I think it's such a low percentage play. But with the fade stop or the back shoulder throw, the defense can't really do anything. They can't be right. And so as long as the quarterback and the receiver are, are sort of operating in tandem, there's, it's a really, really hard play to defend. And uh, even though Jeff had to run in a game, uh, I think we had practiced that play hundreds, if not oh, yeah. thousands of times. Um, but you watch our whole team. I mean, every skill position player was a first or second year player. We, we didn't have any juniors or seniors. I mean, Jeff, Jeff aside, he was still a first year player with us. And so um, we were so young across the board um, in, in all the receiver positions, tight end, running back. And, and it, was, it was crazy. I mean, that, as I think back to your question about the first half, it was probably because like, we didn't have a lot of, of upperclassmen playing in those positions. Uh, I don't know if we had any, but um, so it was to be where we were, it, it made sense to, uh, to go with the, to go to the guy who had the most poise and at that moment in time was Jeff and, uh, you know, throw the back shoulder and hope he caught it on a rainy day. 
And Jeff, now I'll turn to you on this one. And, and it's the kind of play that is a receiver, you have a lot to going on right there. You have to know position on the field. You have to know clock because if you didn't get in the end zone there, you might not have gotten another snap off. The team probably wouldn't have. Um, so you have to stick the ball over the end zone. Um, take us through that play. And, and again, if how, as much as you remember of it from your perspective. Absolutely. So – I'd love to tell you I had all these great thoughts like I need to stick the ball over the goal line and I need to, you know, set everything up perfectly. But to be honest, I was just hanging on because we were pretty gassed from running all the way down the field. Uh, I knew, though, we ran, you know, slants uh, the play prior, and uh, I knew that uh, a quick inside move would, uh, would be able to get the defender kind of uh, off balance to try to get some separation uh, to go back towards the, uh, the back pylon. That's how you kind of set up this pass to get the, uh, the DB shoulders turned. So uh, the other big thing is to, to line up correctly to give yourself enough room to kind of go out towards the, uh, the sideline there and still be able to catch the ball in bounds. So uh, I was able to uh, just kind of get off the ball uh, quickly, which is important with uh, somebody pressing uh, uh, up in your face like that. And then Dan, Dan just threw a, a absolutely perfect pass. Um, and I just remember – you know, just doing what we practiced. It was, you know, basically like any other practice play, just reaching out, catching the ball. And then I'll be honest, once I caught it, I blacked out and I don't really know what happened, but I guess we scored a touchdown. <laughs> uh, Bobby, do you remember watching that from the sideline? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was a heart, heart attack, you know, at a very young age. <clears throat> yeah. Like we, I mean, the, the fourth downs is to convert three of them, you know, and as a competitor, you know, I was still really down because we, we let the go-ahead touchdown happen after we have been struggling all day. And then we just, you know, and then we finally take the lead. And, uh, you know, so I, I was just, I was just thinking about, man, like we, we let this, we let it go. Like we put our team in a bad spot after we'd been playing pretty well all day and, 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 you know, we got bailed out. So like every play of this fourth down conversion was just incredible. And then, and, and then yeah then down on the goal line when when Jeff caught it you know and I'm watching it and I, I'll be honest I watched it like 10 times I'm I'm not convinced as a defender that you crossed the goal line from <laughs> <laughs> but you know thank god that he did um but it, it was I think after that it was just euphoria I mean there was just like such an energy in the in the in the, in the house and uh Tommy Z I think just like lost it um even more than he usually does uh, so I just remember just being like just so elated as, as, a, as a whole group um and just happy for everybody and yeah there's still John, real real quick just to to add you know after we scored and there was there was elation and it was a combination of you know of us apparently going to win and everybody being happy for the team but a lot of people were happy for Jeff I mean they were just it couldn't have happened to a better person with everything that he had to do to put himself in that situation, how he persevered through all his injuries and all his years in college. You know, we had primarily, you know, first and second year players, but Jeff was like 24 years old, I think at that time. Um, to see the guys just so heartfeltly be happy for him. And everyone was just so pumped up for him that, we when we went for two uh, on the extra on the next play because the only the only way we could have lost that game was if they blocked the extra point and ran it back that was it so we're you know I, I looking back we should have just knelt on the ball but you know well let's just give it to Corey, Corey. we only had ten guys on the field I thought it was nine for many <laughs> years I went back because no one really you know everyone was just surrounding Jeff um, and we we ran that play with like ten guys. Yeah, yeah, Coach, uh, I do believe I was supposed to be in on that play. That is my bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, there, there is one more play after that, too. Besides the two-point conversion, there's two seconds left. So, you know, there's always a chance for a miracle. Bobby, were you on kick coverage teams? Did you have to go back yeah. out there for that one? Yeah, I played – all of us played special teams. Um, I think I was on every special team unit. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we practiced that. I mean, that, that's, that's one that we do every single week. I mean, it's kind of cliche, but you practice that scramble drill um, and you just kind of do what you can just to maintain leverage and, and get them to the ground. And, you know, it's not a simple thing to do, but yeah, we, we were prepared. 
Um, we were really, adrenaline was really kicked in. Um, and I, I watched it again. Brown got the ball at the end, which, uh, you know, he's a unique character. Uh, one of <laughs> both Jeff and my former roommates. Um, yeah. So uh, it was pretty cool to see. Yeah, just like when that happened, then you could finally like exhale, uh, knowing that we had to do one more, one more job. You know, it's funny, um, the things you think about when you go back and you watch these games. And, and at the end of that game, the only thing I could think about is, what was Hugh Marshall saying at that point? And so I'm going to ask you all, <laughs> did anyone have a conversation with Hugh after that game? Did, did anyone talk to him? Because I imagine if anyone was on cloud nine, it was Hugh at that point. Yeah, Hugh, uh, I, I think deep down, is probably more excited you know, than anybody. Uh, <laughs> it, it's sort of something that, and you talk to him, he, he'd been working his whole career for that moment too. And his careers were a lot longer, his career was a lot longer than ours, you know, as four-year players and stuff. So, um, you know, he was, he was always just loving those big time moments. And he could, he could rattle off plays that happened, you know, even as I talked to him after I graduated, like, hey, do you remember that play again? Uh, or sinus your freshman year? Like, no, but, you know, he, he would always have those, those memories. And I think they were really important to him. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I can only imagine how, how excited he was for that, that win. Um, Greg, in terms of what that win meant for the program going forward, it, you know, it, again, we spoke about it. The team had, you know, kind of been around 500 the previous few years. And that catapulted the team forward to a point where, you know, you made the playoffs three straight years. Um, you know, it, it, the program has really been one of the top programs in the country since. What did that win mean for the program from that point going forward? I think it gave us some legitimacy um, uh, nationally and, and within our, our own group, because no one knew. I, I mean, no one could foresee this. And, you know, we heard, you know, you, don't, you guys don't play anybody, your schedule's weak. Um, you know, even after the season, um, you know, somebody asked me, well, is this kind of a once in a lifetime thing? Is it kind of a fluke? I go, absolutely not. I go, we're going to be really, really good these next two years. And you look at that, it really turned into a five-year span um, where we went 47-3 and three over a five-year period. And those last two years after Dan and, and Bobby and that group left, um, I, I, we weren't as talented. But the confidence from what we had done, and probably starting from that game, won us a lot of games. It really did. We had no right going 9-1 in 2011, uh, just didn't have that great of a team. But we just stepped on the field, and because of what Bobby and, and Dan and that group had established, we just knew we were going to win. Somehow we are going to win. Um, Bobby and Dan's next two years, a lot of those games, I mean, they, they were just blowouts. I mean, not even close. We, we had a really, really good team. Um, you know, if we don't get in the playoffs – I we lose that game, you know, maybe it changes it a little bit, but um, I just think that that gave us a lot of confidence moving forward that we belonged. Um, guys, and thank you again for joining us. I'd like to just, before we go, you know, ask if you don't mind just catching us up, what you've done since Case Western Reserve and where are you now? And Dan, we'll start with you. Uh, bounced around quite a bit, uh, but you know, went back to business school there at the university, uh, 2012, 13. And, um, I've since been working in commercial real estate and uh, right now got a pretty exciting project that we just broke ground on in Ohio City right down the street and so uh, that's right at the corner across from the west side markets so you can watch that come out of the ground the next uh, 18 months or so and a uh, really really exciting project that I spent pretty much my entire life for the last two years working on so uh, finally we're able to see that that get going in the midst of this uh, crazy time where we got to all be sheltered up and um, it's been a lot of work, but it's exciting to see it come out of the ground. Bobby, how about you? What are you up to nowadays? Yeah, so I'm just down the street from Dan in Chicago. Um, <clears throat> so it's good to be back. I was in California for about six years at my previous company. Um, I have a one-year-old son. You might hear him right now. Um, he just turned one last week. So it's been a, a game changer um, and an awesome uh, experience thus far. And then uh, what I do for my profession, I actually joined a, an early stage company uh, that does 3D printing and advanced manufacturing. Um, and uh, so I lead, I lead all operations there. 
Um, and uh, we're making just an incredible amount of parts for this pandemic. Um, so we're, you know, a lot of people are sheltered in place and you know, I'm honestly busier than I've ever been um, trying to create these products. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been a pretty wild ride. You know, post, post, uh, post case, um, East Coast, West Coast, now here in Chicago. Um, but the bonds that we have, I mean, I see Dan every weekend. Um, so it's just, it's just great to, great to connect back with everybody. And Jeff, how about you? What did you do after you left Case and what have you been doing uh, recently? Jeff has yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, As soon as I left Case Western, I actually uh, uh, raised the right and joined the uh, United States Navy. Uh, so I went through officer candidate school and uh, went through flight training, and uh, I am currently, uh, I have about 10 years flying the FAA team uh, for the Navy. Um, did one combat deployment in 2015 uh, for Operation Air Resolve, and uh, was a flight instructor, uh, also a tactical demonstration pilot, uh, which unfortunately last year I was supposed to do in Cleveland, but it got canceled, uh, so that was kind of a bummer. But uh, I've been living in Virginia Beach uh, for the past seven years now, uh, and really, I must say, uh, I don't know if there's one moment that can define somebody's life, but uh, I will say as soon as uh, that first year I showed up at Case really kind of projected uh, me in, uh, in, a, in a great path. And uh, the friendships that I made there and the contacts and everything really kind of set me up for success. So, um, you know, I've had a, a pretty amazing uh, career in the Navy so far. And, uh, you know, I attribute a lot of that to uh, my experiences at Case Western. Well, guys, thank you all again for joining us. Um, you know, again, it's one of the great games in the history of the entire athletic department. Um, you know, one of, one of the great moments. And I think hearing all your perspectives on it is just fascinating. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks, John. Thanks, yeah. John. John. John.